are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone. I'm Bradley and I'll be our moderator today. And thank you for joining us here at Netcom Learning. As a company that provides training, learning, and talent development solutions and wants to promote lifelong learning, we're happy to host today's webinar on how to quant quantify disruption and protect your business against it. And presenting today's topic is Vincent Supa. Vincent teaches graduate business courses at New York University as a, is an efficiency hacker and a certified executive Six Sigma black belt. He specializes in working with pre-IPO startups, helping them to position themselves for public offering, acquisition, or merger. He's worked in Asia as an expat, as well as in the US high tech industry and European telecommunication industry. Self-described as a part of Generation Flux, he is the founding president of HR Avant-Garde. And I'll be tweeting from at Netcom Learning using hashtag quantify disruption and feel free to do the same. We'll just give you a quick overview of the logistics before we get started. To start with, you have the option to adjust the window size to your liking. Simply hit the escape key and find the zoom button on the top left corner of your GoToWebinar. Everyone has been muted except for our presenters. Also, a PDF of today's slides are in the questions pane, and I'll send that out again in a few moments. Please feel free to submit any questions you have for the presenter here in the questions pane. We'll address them at the end of the session. And today's session is being recorded, so you will get free access to the recording in the next 24 hours via email. I'll just take a few moments to show you where, we, where you can access that recording. All right, here in the Netcom Learning website, if you go to free webinars tab, and then scroll all the way to the bottom, there should be a view recording button with the, today's webinar. And at the top, there are our future webinars, and you can enroll for as many as you like. Just as an FYI, we also offer a host of other business and IT courses and certifications, which you can find in these tabs up here. You'll also find some promotions running on the classes we offer if you click on the Promotions tab. And right now we are offering a discount on PMP courses. And without further ado, here is Vincent to present today's topic. Vincent, are you there? Yes, thank you, Bradley. Thank you so much. So thank you for joining me this afternoon. The least you need to know about disruption and how to protect your business against it in 18 minutes. Let's get started. Now, let's talk about the cost of doing nothing. We now see a shortening cycle between innovation and disruption. So if we look at Napster, Amazon, Apple with their ecosystem of iTunes and whatnot, they completely destroyed the retail music industry, Tower Records. Underpowered personal computers have replaced mini computers and mainframes from the 1960s and 70s. And of course, digital photography has made film obsolete. So understand that what really makes a disruption a disruption is not the technological breakthrough, as, as most people would assume, but the business model. For example, Kodak was basically destroyed by digital photography, but Kodak was the same company that invented digital photography. Because essentially, if you take an idea and you don't monetize it, it, it might be a, a wonderful science, scientific breakthrough, but without the business model, it cannot be sustained as a disruption. And we also have other examples of P&G developed the Swiffer that we touched upon last month's uh, webinar. And then we also uh, alluded to Apple with their iPod, iTunes, iPad, and their iPhones. So let's jump in. Now, disruption is not uh, you know, is a process. It's not a single event. Now, disruption could either be quick and complete or slow and gradual and incomplete. For example, when air freight uh, became prominent, most people incorrectly predicted the demise of cargo ships. And when the VCR came out, movie owners anticipated the end of, uh, of people going to the movies. And we see that these two disruptions were essentially incomplete. So I want you to think of disruption as a missile. It could completely miss you. 
it could graze by you, or it could be a direct hit and destroy your your company uh, completely. So I want to introduce a new marketing demographic. Now the traditional demographic would be uh, social economic, gender, age, income, education level. Right, that's the traditional marketing demographic. But let's replace it with a purpose-driven demographic, and it's defined this way: view your product in terms of what jobs or benefits that the customer wants from it. And I'm going to say it again. Our new marketing demographic is not male, female, 18 to 34 year old. No. Our new marketing demographic is a purpose driven demographic. Viewing your product or service in terms of what jobs or the benefits customers want from it. Now let's look at the antithesis of disruption. If Holiday Inn, for example, wanted to compete with the plaza. They could. They would spend money on internal improvements, prime real estate, expensive service staff. But this would be competition, not disruption. Why? Because it would force Holiday Inn to adopt the same cost structure as the plaza. So the business model would be the same, and that's why this example is not a disruption. So a disruption is not adapting the cost structure of the competitors. Now let's look at some other examples. Now disruptive upstarts maintain their cost advantage while improving performance. Personal computers were a disruption. They had a completely different business model. It was an innovation rather than a low-end computer due to a radical cost advantage by a standardized components. Because remember, many computers did not have standardized components. So through the years, PCs increased their cost advantage while simultaneously increasing power, capacity, and utility of their product. And then, of course, many computers could compete on performance, but they would have to invest in even more costly customized system. This is what makes the PCs a complete disruption to the mini computers that existed in the 60s and 70s. So what makes an innovation disruptive? Well first we have a technological breakthrough and then we have a disruptive innovation and then we have a business model advantage that scales. So even though Kodak invented digital photography, that was the technological breakthrough, but they never were able to monetize it and that's why uh, they essentially went bankrupt because they were not able to compete with something that they themselves invented. So disruptions usually move up market searching for more demanding customers. And again, disruption is not a price competition but a better business model. Let's look at higher education as an example. Online schools that have no campuses, that only exist online, they grant more degrees to more students at a lower cost compared to traditional schools. And e-learning technologies enable faculty to reach more customers than a professor could in a single university hall. Now when online universities first became prominent after the internet became commercialized, the initial quality was inferior. But as the model predicts, online schools improve their effectiveness while maintaining their cost advantage. And this, of course, attracts more upstream students from traditional uh, university alternatives. So let's look at our new marketing demographic. Let's look at three jobs that colleges perform for three different type of marketing demographics, which we call our customers, acquiring, acquiring knowledge, community, and credentialing. Now let's say, for example, that you're someone, you have a JD, you have an MBA, but you're starting your own business and you just need to understand accounting. You're not looking for credentialing because you have degrees and you're not looking for a sense of community. You're not 18 years old and you want to live away from home for the first time, join a sports team. You just want knowledge. That is one job. And an online university could easily do that. But for acquiring community and credentialing, that might be a job that an online university might not do as well. So online education would be a partial disruption based on the business model. So again, we're going to view our product in terms of what jobs customers want from it. So one job that people want from online education or university degree is seeking exclusive branding of their resume. But an online university, like the University of Phoenix, whatnot, 
their advantage lies in serving greater numbers with less assets. And that, of course, is the antithesis of, of exclusivity. Now, if you look at those seeking the social aspects of college, living away from home, a sense of community, um, participating in a sports team, well, that's another job that online education really cannot serve as well, especially if it remains exclusively online. So e-learning schools eventually go upstream by offering both online and on-campus courses. And right now we have University of Phoenix is considered a marquee university within the online. In fact, one of the members of the Obama administration uh, was featured as having gone to the University of Phoenix. Um, there's a football stadium named after them. So they are gradually going upstream to attract even more customers at a wider margin. But if an online university then starts to have a campus, well, they gradually begin to adopt the course structure of traditional schools. So we would call the online education a partial disruption. Now, frequently, firms react to disruptions equally across the board, where they spend resources defending ultimately indefensible jobs. And they don't really put the resources in jobs that they would always do better than the disruptor. And that's why in order to protect our business against disruption, let's figure out what are the multiple jobs that our different customers want from the same product or services. So again, it comes down to this. People want products to complete jobs that differ across the same product or service. So let's forget age, gender, and the traditional demographics. Let's categorize customers into differing benefits that they receive from the product. So let's look at uh, an example of students in a college dorm. Students do not shop for floor cleaner sponge buckets for their own sake, but for the impending arrival of parents. So the physical objects of a cleaner or bucket sponges have no intrinsic value. It is the desire to stay on good terms with the parents. That's the job that the student wants from the cleaning supplies. So because of that, you might have bookstores sell cleaning samples in a bucket, or you might have someone offer um, dorm room cleaning within an hour's notice, because obviously a student would not want the dorm room cleaned too much in advance, because they want to clean right before the parents uh, show up. So that might be a job that a student wants from cleaning, which might differ from a traditional marketing demographic. So let's have a three-step summary. First, identify the disruptor's advantage. For example, online university delivers knowledge transfer in a more cost-effective way than a traditional university. Then identify your own advantages. So if you're a traditional university, it might be that you have the sense of community and the credentialing. How easily a disruptor can co-op your advantages while maintaining radically lower prices is how to measure the level of danger of the disruption and what to decide to defend and let go. So tell your marketing department, let's articulate the end jobs people accomplish with your product or service. So an 18 to 34 year old female and a male senior citizen may be doing the same exact thing with your product. So under this new marketing demographic, we would put them in the same demographic. So this makes traditional demographics superfluous, and yet they still tend to dominate how people uh, segregate their, their marketing audience. So if you look at CDs and online, right, that was a complete disruption. Now CDs still exist, of course, for music, but it's really for a niche, for a niche market, the same way people still collect vinyl. Um, but online delivers music quicker and radically lower because there's no shipment of a CD. You don't have the transportation cost of moving it to a retail store and customers don't have to drive to that retail store. So we would call this a complete disruption. Now let's talk about our partial disruption example of how air freight was only a partial disruption to ocean freight. Now ships move from quail to rail to truck to loading dock. So ships, unlike air freight, benefit from their own ecosystem. Now, what would it take for air freight to disrupt ocean freight? Now, airlines could assault ocean freight and be 
even more of a disruption if they put in their own ecosystem, if they had railroad tracks right to the airport. Now that would begin adopting the same cost structure as ocean freight, so that would be competition, but it wouldn't it would not be nearly as much of a disruption as if there were new technologies where they had cheaper renewable jet fuel. Imagine the scenario where planes flew on solar energy. In that example, the cost of air freight would be so inexpensive, then that might go towards a complete disruption of ocean freight because under that example air freight would have a radical cost advantage and it would not have to adopt the same cost structure as ocean freight but right now because travel uh, transport is expensive in general um, air freight is not as viable for large bulk shipments now let's look at an example for movies when home entertainment systems came out people predicted the demise of people going to the movies. But let's look at the jobs that people want from a movie. One is content. Okay, in that sense, home entertainment system might be a complete disruption of that one job. But people also go to the movies to get out of the house. Imagine a married couple, they finally have a babysitter. Yes, they have a home entertainment system, but they want to get out of the house. That would be the same demographic as a young teenage couple that's dating that, yes, their parents have a home entertainment system, but the job they want the movie experience to give them is to get out of the house. So in that sense, we have our young couple on the left and our senior citizens on the right. They're actually in the same demographic. So again, our new marketing demographic based on the jobs that people want completed by our product and services, that makes the traditional marketing demographic superfluous. Now, HR executive comp plans really incentivize behavior, and many executives are incentivized to focus on profit and revenue, which makes sense. But imagine profit as a proxy for the value of your product or services, and imagine an HR comp plan that really incentivizes executives uh, really coming up with more uh, jobs that can be completed with the same product or services. Think of the value of your product as a leading indicator for profit. And the more jobs or benefits that different customers can gain from your product and services, the more revenue streams you would develop. So often and traditionally, firms struggle to keep customers unlikely to be lost to disruption by dropping prices or offering more bells and whistles. But just by dropping the price to compete with a disruption, that ultimately will fail because it fails to identify the advantage of the disruptor and it ignores the advantages that your legacy system, that your legacy business could more easily defend. So let's not look at demographics, but let's look at intention. So the traditional demographics would be frequent shoppers, young parents, discount hunters, and while that may appear to uncover intentions, the description tells us little about the behavior. So if you look at three different demographics going to a grocery store, you have the customer coming in, filling up the cart once a week uh, with non-perishable items. The second demographic, someone zipping in to purchase an emergency item like toothpaste at the last minute at 9.30 in the evening. And the third demographic would be people coming in in the late afternoon to purchase ingredients for tonight's dinner. So on the demographics on the right, we now understand what customers are trying to accomplish. And hopefully that you will see that for our first demographic, customers buying non-perishables, online grocery shopping, Peapod, Fresh Direct, that would be a direct hit. But in terms of customers buying perishable items at the last minute, your traditional retail grocery store, they might not have to drop the price points to compete because that is a demographic that they could more easily, they could more easily defend. So this is just a, a recap. If Fresh Direct were to compete with the demographic of last minute shoppers going in on the same day, yes, they could compete. They could send out dispatch trucks half empty for last minute off for last minute orders, but now they're beginning to adopt the higher core, a higher cost structure. So that would no longer be a disruption. So disruption is rests in the business model. And for people buying non-perishable items once a week, online food shopping does have a radical cost advantage and that would be a more complete disruption. 
Okay, so that's it. So hopefully uh, next month, uh, if you care to join us, we'll be covering the new employer and employee contract and how to leverage that. Eighteen minutes. Thank you, Bradley. Hey, Vincent. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, we do have some questions. Are you ready to get into them? Yes, I am. All right. I have one here. Um, can you talk about disruption in the medical and healthcare field? Oh sure, that's something that uh, that I'm very interested very interested in. Um, medical equipment can be very very expensive, and in fact, um, I just recently uh, interviewed a, a startup, and they have medical imaging, and essentially medical imaging devices could be anywhere between fifty thousand to two hundred thousand dollars, and uh, I, I believe the company's Alexapath. Uh, they're a startup. And for a couple of thousand dollars, um, they could uh, do tests that detect cervical cancer, uh, essentially by connecting an adapter uh, to a smartphone. And so what that is, that's disrupting the medical uh, industry because a pathologist, let's say in Rome, could really uh, diagnose uh, cervical cancer of, of, of someone that's still um, that's still remote. So we're getting into something called um, telemedicine, where just the way the internet made location superfluous, telemedicine means that it will match needs to resources, and those resources, pathologists, doctors, do not always have to be in the same uh, location. So I believe that's something that should bring the price points down of healthcare and certainly make, make healthcare uh, more affordable for more people. Perfect, perfect. And I have just one more. Where do you see disruption in ed education 10 years from now? Um, well, I'm also uh, teach at New York University, and so I'm, I'm following this very, very closely. Um, I essentially see university professors transforming into facilitators. With computer-based learning, more and more learning will be customized. I mean, if you look at the educational system in the United States from K through 12, it's almost run as a command and control system. But with computer-based learning, online education, education would be uh, tailored to individuals and the traditional teacher, the traditional university professor will still have an important role, but instead of lecturing to the class, that information will be made available through distributive input uh, through online learning. So the professor will now become the facilitator and really teach via exception management, meaning covering the topics individualized and customized to individual students for concepts that he or she might not be able to grasp from the online learning. So I do believe it will transform, it will continue to transform uh, adult education as well as K through 12. Great. And before we end over here, uh, Vincent, do you have any final thoughts about today's topic? Um, I do think that the the rate of change is certainly going to is certainly going to decrease. Um, I read a lot uh, about generation flux. I consider myself a part of generation flux, and uh, that's really a demographic not based on on age or or locality, but really talks about people that understand the difference between um, between uncertainty and ambiguity. And I think things are changing uh, so rapidly. Each of us are going to adopt the role of lifelong uh, learner because what we know today, with all these disruptions, may become obsolete even in a couple of e even in a couple of years. So it's an exciting time, but it also means that we're on the fast track and we need to learn how to learn in order to stay competitive. Great. Well, thanks, Vincent, for presenting today's topic. Thank you, Bradley. All right, and thanks to all for joining us today. If you do come up with any more questions, feel free to send them to webinar at netcom learning. Dot com and we will be answering within 24 hours. And thank you so much for joining Netcom Learning today. We hope you found today's webinar informative and we look forward to seeing you soon. Feel free to tell your friends and colleagues about our webinars and other courses. And thank you so much again, Vincent, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, Bradley. Bye.